sorry about this, just have to restart my Chrome. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. I was expecting a few more people. Shoko, hi. Um, but we'll get started with what we have. What we have. Um, welcome to the Aggregation Lab. You've all been here before, so there's really no introductions needed um, as far as what the lab is. Oops. So today's topic is student curated content. Um, just a reminder that you can get to the web page. It's easy to follow instructions. We're having all kinds of cut issues today. And the reason to do that again is because at the very bottom of the activity sheet, there are opportunities for you to um, add your notes to the bottom under here. So, student curated content. What are the topics and questions that you'd like to have us discuss today so that when you leave, we will make you happy? And we'd like to start. Who you are? Would you like to start? Matthew. Um, Matthew, uh, mechanical engineering grad student. Um, interested in discussing how to make discussion boards more, just more. I mean, like, students don't really use them all that often, so how can you make it more enticing for students? All right, I'm going to put discussion in quotes um, because, well, we get into discussion boards. In some ways, that's the basic of students sharing with each other, right? Yeah, I mean, I know there's other ways, you know, like Piazza and things like yep. that, but trying to keep it all like, within Canvas yep. would be helpful. Yep, um, I'm going to add that as a second point. Keep it in Canvas. Very good. Laura or Laura? Hi. Um, I'm Lauren. I do random stuff. Um, I'm curious what people do with the curated content after they have it in whatever format they have, the variety of things that they can do. When you say what do you do with it, do you mean at the end of the semester? Of do you? How do you build off of it? So you gotten students to create all of these great things together in a space. What are you now going to do to make it another level of meaningful? I like that question. And then three dots. All right, you got the curated content, now what? Very good. JT. A uh, similar question, how do you, what do you do with it over the course of the semester, or, or what's the outcome of curation? Cool, we're going to go to back to design there and say, why curate it? Peter. Um, I'm Peter Van Ken, I'm a neuroscientist working in the geology department. Um, I, I, actually, I had Matthew's question in mind first because the discussion boards are kind of like a basic interactive thing. But um, I, 
you know, I'm in favor of, you know, the students learning as much as possible of the content that we provide them with. And um, what I'm interested in is kind of like, you know, to figure out what are the most efficient ways for students to be, to engage with the content that can save the instructor's time and effort. Because, you know, let's face it, if one uses a discussion board with a class with 50 students, and you, you know, like the standard thing is, well, post, make a post and respond to two others, you end up with this gigantic thing that's unmanageable for both instructors as, as well as students. And so, you know, the, what are the most efficient ways of dealing with this? You know, making it more manageable and more enjoyable and more um, didactic for the students while kind of preserving the, the utility for the instructor as well. Okay, so I put down saving instructor time. We may best use instructor provided content, but I feel like there's one other thing in there. We'll go with that, and if, if, if it comes up, we can come up with something else. Good, Shoko. I'm Shoko Miyagi. I'm with uh, I'm actually here to learn just because I don't really know much about this content. Okay, and you're all online courses, right? Yeah. So that's another. Um, so it would be like the pre recorded ones. So asynchronous. All right, online and asynchronous. Versus face to face, blended. And there's overlap there, right? Because Lynn does some online stuff as well. Lynn. Hi, I'm Lynn Gross, I teach in the chemistry department. And I would love to see some examples of what kinds of things people are doing. Um, this topic reminds me of a question that I asked a few weeks ago that I can teach around about leveraging student expertise. Um, because I Imagine that some sort of student curated thing would lend itself well to on some you know, students who are who already have a lot of background knowledge in this topic. I mean, add a versus to that. Um, how about versus opinions? Because oftentimes students have more opinions than they have expertise, right? And so, how do we? Sort through that. Good. Paul. Uh, Paul Oliphant uh, from School of Business. I've um, been reading some books and things on, on uh, engaging students more in courses, and this seems like a really uh, valuable method to really bring students and engage them in the, in the curriculum. Um, and I, I know so far I've seen uh, you know discussion boards and, and activities. I'm also interested to see what students could do with regards to assessments and how students can be curating and uh, kind of working through the assessment portion of the course. So you, are you talking about just sort of peer review of each other's work? Or? So I've seen some of that. Um, uh, so as I, I was I was reading, they were they were mentioning bringing students more in a collaborative way for um, for the assessment piece. One of the things I've seen in the past, for example, is have students generate uh, questions for the upcoming exam. For example, so essentially, as I said, really to to engage students more deeply into the content by making them. Uh, creator almost. I love that. Okay, great. Uh, really taking taking the faculty and really putting them squarely as a facilitator rather than just the person who knows everything. Right. Mm -hmm. Again, kind of like what Lynn was saying, there's a lot of expertise in our students. Now, again, as you said, there's some sorting that needs to take place here. Mm -hmm. Just can't take it lock, stock, and barrel. Yep. There's, you know, and, and how can you do 
that and I see a lot of student curation of content uh, in all aspects of, of the course being perhaps one of those mechanisms we can use. So I'm here actually mostly to listen. Okay. But that's kind of what I'm listening for. Very good. We're going to make you do more than listen. Noah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Armola from Plant Pathology, and one of the main classes I work with is Plants, Parasites, and People. And it's a large class that most people don't want to take. Um, oh, what a great name. It's great. And it, there's so many like crossovers. And I think students come into class 100 level signs, gen ed, get it out of the way. Um, they just want to be given information. But because it's such a cool class and has such a great title, um, I want to figure out ways to encourage students to uh, make connections between their real life, you know, things that are happening, and what they're sitting there, you know, what they feel like we're making them learn. Um, so I guess just examples of what people use in terms of assignments for student period that comes from the class would be really helpful. I'm going to put in Brett and connect it to the expertise, but also their experience, right? And I think that that, in some ways, that's the why of why do we do student curated content? Because we have this content and we do it in this sort of generic, sanitized, sterile room that has nothing, very little to do with their lives, except in the fact that they spend a lot of their time as college students in these kinds of rooms, right? But they're artificially constructed, right? It's fake. That's not what their actual life is like unless they go on to be instructors or staff members where they live in these rooms for the rest of their lives. Real life generally not inside these rooms. How do we connect the content that we are providing to them to their actual lives? Now, if they go into the discipline, presumably the content's going to make a lot of sense, right? And they will soon start to see themselves as whateverologists, um, where that's their identity. That's they value that because that's what they've studied. How do you get them to start thinking of themselves as whateverologists? Um, and the way to do that is to start saying, "Hey, this is already happening in your life," which is why plants, parasites, and people says, "You know, plants, parasites, and people. It's a trio. You can't separate them." They're part of your life every day as is. So go out and find examples of plants, parasites, and people in your life because it's already happening. Um, you've got, how many of you have parasites in there? Yeah, right? Um, so that's, that's why. That's why we connected because once they start to recognize in their daily lives, oh, this is content that we talked about. This is content that we talked about. They walk down the streets and they start saying, content, 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 content. And that's that distributed learning that continues on through their life rather than the, we talked about this in class and we're never going to talk about it again. No, they go out and they actually make connections to the rest of their lives. Um, and that's, the research is huge on this, um, distributed learning, connecting, making it experiential. Um, that's why we want student curated content. Thoughts on that? JT. The initial question or the initial thought I have is, to me that seems more like a photo reel, right? You're asking students to take a thousand different photos, for example, of roses or something that they see at Alice Centennial Garden, but what would be the, the, the end goal of that curation unless the, the design is sort of a problem-focused something, because otherwise you're just going to get sort of a mystical Right? Um, oh, great. Numerous examples of photos of roses. I mean, that's great, you know, but what does that push students to do in terms of evaluate those experiences? Yeah, well, and it also doesn't really talk to the connection piece. Sure, there are these pieces of, there are roses in my life, um, but who cares? I don't care about roses, mm -hmm. right? So, what is the connection to things that I'm actually passionate about? Not just do I see it, but do I care about it? Anybody have thoughts on on that? It, it all depends on the cue that you give the students. A lot of it, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I have a, 
an assignment, say, you know, like um, provide evidence how we analyze the world around us and create reality, for example. That would be one, you know, a very argument. deep question, yes. Well, yeah, it's that, you know, it's like getting neuroscience degree. Sure, okay, about, yeah. You know, how do we create reality? I mean, it's an important question. And so you could say, okay, well, you go out. I mean, we live in reality. And so everybody kind of like gets an example of, you know, how we analyze the world around us, of us and how we all combine that into, you know, an internal model that we have, that we base our interactions with the environment and the movements we make and this and that on. So the, 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 the answer, rather than it just being a compilation of a list or a bunch of pictures, is, okay, the next step, look at the list, look at the roses that you've done, look at the way that you've created reality, your examples, how does it compare to the way that Armola did it? How does it compare to the way that Shoko did it? How does it compare to the way that Matthew did it? And once you start looking at that, you'll see that they have much different examples because they looked at the world from plants, parasites, and people, online education, mechanical engineering. Like there are different ways that they look at the world. And seeing, I think, especially as a new student, I might not understand what the content's about or why it's important, but if I start seeing how other people value it, like we are socially constructed people with socially constructed values, and at some level, especially in starting out, we get our values from other people's values, our peer groups, right? And if our peers all value something, that's kind of interesting. If one subset of the peers value it in a way that makes me more excited than another peer group. Now I found an affinity group within that peer group, and I can start saying, oh, I like the way that these people start thinking about it. Let's dig in with them a little bit more. In some ways, I might identify a cohort of um, study partners. In other ways, I might say, you know, I already know what these people think about. I've never thought about it this way. Now I've got a different avenue of ways to think about things. That multi-perspective um, ways of looking at whatever the content is, I think really helps us dimensionalize the content. So is it perfect? No, it will never be, but I think it provides enough threads for people to start to pull on. And for some people it won't because they're busy with other things or this is a class that they're forced to take and they don't care about it, and maybe they won't ever care about it, but I kind of feel like one of the um, things that we need to do, especially at the early stages, early level classes, is force them to say, find a connection with your life. Go do that. I'm going to give you points to do that. Otherwise, they'll just sit and listen, and maybe something will stick, maybe it won't stick, but they won't be actively working to make it stick. Peter. I like your example that you just went through of taking people's perspective. And I, I want to add a little concrete example of something that's really basic, but um, will make the point. You know, like, I mean, we all can look at, say, the net, and it's, and, you know, come to the conclusion it's light blue. Yeah. But since color doesn't exist in our real life, I mean, it's all kind of like a mental interpretation of, you know, the different wavelengths of light. The way you interpret this blue is different from the way that I interpret it or that Lauren interpreted it. Yeah. And so, you know, like, so although we've used to, to say, oh, well, this is blue, you know, our experience differs. And so we can learn from those differences, you know, and but it's not a thing that we wouldn't that we would be able to see unless we started to have a conversation about well how do you see blue well how do you see blue well how do you see blue because we're very myoptic no monooptic we see the things the way that we yeah. see things yeah. unless we get the input from other people in other words JT yeah I was just thinking to respond to Alston sort of like you're listening for in terms of the sub I mean it just seems 
the end of the semester, all of comparing these experiences with you, just co-created assessment strategy for the course. And you could even link that to um, the Wisconsin experience and having those direct connections in the student understanding and relentless curiosity, et cetera, um, within the assessment process and can use that sort of self-reflective, you know, comparing one uh, another colleague's perspective to be an easy, not so easy, but a reasonable way to assess that. I don't know, in business course work, that's that would look like there are the number of students that you may or may not have, but is that a good route? Well, and the idea of the Wisconsin experience and student curated content is, I think, just a wonderful, um, on all four of the pillars, empathy and humility. Like, okay, I see the world, I see this shade of blue, but I understand because I understand neuroscience that um, you see it differently and you see it differently. So I can empathize and, and you know, be humble enough to say that my view of blue is not the correct view of blue and yours is all wrong. Um, I'm curious as to how do you see blue, relentless curiosity, I have the intellectual confidence to say, this is what I think the blue looks like. And purposeful action, I guess, is, is sort of the big, like, I don't know, we can get to that. How do we, is it important that I understand blue, that we understand blue differently? And business, it might be a lot more practical. Mechanical engineering can be a lot more practical. Let's use that shared understanding, that crowdsourcing of ideas, um, shared examples, et cetera, in order to come up with a solution that makes the world a better place, mm -hmm. purposefully. So, John, what is the student curated? What are some examples of student curated content? Good. Um, who has examples of student curated content? What do you already do? What have you already done? Presentations would be a good example. Everybody presentation on a topic, you go research that topic and you come up and you get 10 minutes to share your topic. The way what's shared there is my research, my presentation, my format, my intellectual confidence to be able to say student curated content is X, Y, and Z. That's shared. So yes, that's a very sort of traditional version of uh, student curated content. What are some others? I've created spaces where students, um, where if there's a specific topic or whatever, students add links related to that topic to a single space. Okay. Whether it's using a collaborative bookmarking tool or it's just a uh, editable web page, it doesn't really matter. Um, the, where they've all come together to accomplish something related. So this is one of my favorite ways because as instructors and and traditionally an instructor will say today's topic is this. Here's an example of this. Here's another example of this. Here's another example of this. Here's a dead white male um, canonized figure in our history who has done this stuff. And okay, next topic, we move on, right? And so we get the instructor's version, what she or he, they, um, created and what they went through, how they learned it, but oftentimes the instructor does not look like the people in the, in, in the rest of the class. And what is important to the instructor might not be important to the people in the rest of the class. So saying, okay, here are three examples. Now you go find examples that speak to you. That starts to make a little bit more, make it a little bit more personal because they might come up with things that look a lot different. Now, remind me to get back to the point after we hear from Lauren, but um, the point of are they good examples, are they bad examples, we need to address that in, in a bit. Lauren. So some of my favorites in more recent years is when I don't define anything, but I have like a Facebook group that the class is all part of, and you present something, whatever it is, and then some student just randomly says, hey, building off of what we talked about today, and they just post something. So that's where I get back to what are all the different things that you do with stuff that students share and find for you? Um, because that, that in those cases, it's less planned, right? I didn't ask for it, so I don't have a plan around what I'm going to do with it necessarily. 
but by building off of it, it empowers the student and it encourages more people to just share because they want to. There's something about agency and recognition there, right? right. One, making space in your learning environment so that students can voluntarily say, hey, here's this thing yeah. on their own, not assigned, like that's them taking charge of their learning. Right. We want that. If you get a classroom of students who are doing that, then your job is, is done. They're just teaching themselves. Your job is to just sort of facilitate sort and and be sort of a referee in some ways. Um, I tried to do it in Canvas by creating like a open discussion forum space that's just there all semester. But I see that have a lot of students wanting to go there. That yeah. if I have a social media thing that they are in every day anyway. So I kind of come up with the solution. And that's, I think, another element. If you create an external, this was to, to Matthew's point, outside of Canvas space, rewind that a little bit. If you create a space that the students are already in, if you go to the students space where they're already there, there's a good chance that because they're already familiar with it, they don't have to learn something new. It's not that big of a bother. They're already doing it. Sure, I might as well just do this extra thing as well. Now, we can talk about whether it's good to go into Facebook or, or TikTok or, or wherever students are right now um, as an instructor because many of them don't want you to go into that space. And if you go into that space, you know, just it shuts them down because that's not an academic space. That's, in some ways, that's a different discussion. It's related here. But the point is, if you make them learn something new and say, go use this new complicated thing and share all of your stuff there, it's going to be crickets. It's, they're not, it's not going to be great. I think Canvas Discussions is a great tradition, great, it's a great example of a traditional space that is an academic space. It's also, a, I think, a terrible space to have authentic shared Discussions. Well, and the other piece of that is, say they're you know wandering around on YouTube, yep. and they see something and they're like, oh, that reminds me of what we did in geology today. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a share button there that allows them to directly share to certain social media sites. It but not Canvas. Share to <laughs> <laughs> I know, big surprise, right? Oh. <laughs> so, but you can get the link. You can just grab the link, and you so can't put it in Canvas. They know how to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, but I think that like saying share a link from Canvas or from YouTube into Canvas, you're halfway there because they're on, you're sending them to YouTube. Right. And if you say go find an example of, on YouTube of this mm -hmm. and share it in a discussion forum, a couple of things are going to happen. They'll go to YouTube. They know how to go to YouTube, but they live, like they live on YouTube oftentimes, right? They will not find the first example. Generally, they will not find the first example that comes up. Some of them will. They will find an example. They'll look through like that example. No, that's not really the way that I see it. No, that was not the way I see it. They'll go through five different examples, ten different examples on YouTube, see the content ten, five to ten times. That's like reading five to ten books on, or five to ten articles on the content. Decide among that which one best fits me. Which one is the most accurate? Which one represents um, me well? Which one will make me look cool to my peers? And they'll choose that one. So you're not just saying, read this one article and react to it. You're saying, go find me an article, read 10 articles, find the one that best fits. So they're doing a lot more work. It doesn't feel like work because it's on a platform that they're already on. They're representing their perspective and their, you know, personal viewpoint. You've given them the agency to customize that learning experience, um, and they'll do more work without thinking of it as more work. And then they'll have those five other videos that somebody else will be, will one of, you know, somebody else is going to do one of those videos, and they can have the conversation because they both watched it as they were looking for the video that they would um, talk about. So that's another example. Um, YouTube videos is a 
one of my favorite examples, of, along with links. Um, videos are a little bit more fun for me because a link you can just sort of scan very quickly, but videos you have to sort of watch in serial um, analog and scan a little bit more. JT, you look skeptical. Yeah, just, what do you do with all of this? I mean, it's really just sort of, I, I would think as an instructor, or at least as an instructor, I'm thinking that this becomes sort of a, a beautiful side conversation that students are having, instructors are having sort of um, adjacent to the classroom experience, but it's not necessarily something that is direct, being directly engaged in the classroom experience. It enhances it certainly. Students are finding these materials, you know, on their free time, hopefully, um, and not in the class. But it, what do you do with a collection of 40 videos that students have found? So, so I want to say that it's sort of a waste of energy, but putting it into a press book or just sustaining that in a Google Doc that you share in an additional in the next semester? Or what if those students have to critique each other's and like vote on the best two that, is... that you'll use in the next so this gets into the what does it what does your version of blue look like versus my version of blue? Let's look at all the different versions of blue. Which are the ones that show the best example of you know what's the metaphor that who came up with the best metaphor to explain this? Um, is it the best metaphor to explain it to a twelve year old, or is it the best metaphor to explain it to a, a PhD postdoc in that field? Like which is what are the different levels? Once we start to have the students evaluate and compare and synthesize and say, you know, these types of videos work really well in getting this point across, but these videos work well in getting this point across. This is a good overall video, and this one is uh, it's kind of a fluff piece that maybe uh, if I were explaining it to my grandmother or, um, you know, two-year-old niece or wherever they're at, um, it might be good for different audiences. And now we start thinking about the content critically as a how do I communicate the content, which helps us understand what's important, what's not important, how are these things displayed. And I think that that's, that's, that's a big part of where, where it uh, becomes useful. What to do with it afterwards, um, this is maybe a more specific thing, but Mark Nelson came in a couple of years ago and talked about how he used Pinterest. Now he's in the School of Human Ecology, so design. The students will say, I'm going to create a Pinterest board, if they're called, I think, on um, goth style, whatever, whatever. And so they'll have this board of goth style things that they are sort of the curators, the main curators of. But and somebody else might be like, oh, I'm going to look at mod. I'm going to look at Victorian lace. I'm going to look at whatever the different styles of things are. As the students go through and they look for these designs, they might be focused on Victorian lace, but they actually run across a, a goth thing, and now they say, oh, I should share that with my friend over here who's doing the goth thing, and they'll start having these connections and start looking for things for each other, which builds cohesion and cohort, um, and it starts, you know, they're a specialist in one area, but they are also getting familiar with other areas as well, and that's kind of a neat um, dynamic to see happening. In those kinds of situations, what Lauren was talking about, um, hey, building off of what you're doing, I saw this video, I'm going to share it with you. They'll volunteer that. Um, and that's kind of a neat thing. Peter. Um, I want to um, provide you with another example of the thinking about implementing that kind of addresses what we do with the content after it's being student created. And so I implemented an assignment that's a discussion board um, that I called Moneyest Points. Yep. And so, you know, like I provide, provide you know, multimedia content in press books. <clears throat> and then at, at some point, you know, I asked them to give us give the rationale of a point that they don't quite understand. It's not just putting a question up there, my mm -hmm. point is this, but it's more than that. It's kind of like saying, well, I understand this and this and this, but I don't see how you get from here to here. Oh, I like that. You know, and so that's kind of like an in-depth analysis of why I don't understand things. Right. Like, you know, so um, 
it's it works well, okay. But what what I want to do is kind of like you know since my content is in press books, I want to move this whole twentieth point discussion kind of in hypothesis as kind of like an annotation where cool. they can connect with the content right there. Yeah. You know, and so then I, at the what I imagine I do is kind of like at the end of the semester or you know at the end of the module, then I can see kind of like where people come and where they want to go with their experiences. And you know, I, I have the option then of incorporating that into the next version of the course. You know, like I just modify press book content yeah. to maybe anticipate any problems that they might have. Yeah. Or um, expand on the content as it exists in press books to be more um, appropriate or more um, engaging for the students that would read it. And so, so my idea is that over time, the content in the press books is kind of incorporating all of the students' feedback in terms of what they understand, what they don't understand, what they like, where they go, how they connect things with one another. So, uh, it's formative feedback for the instructor to, to say, how can I adjust my teaching um, in a way that is more authentic, more relevant to students? Now, how many of us have been in that situation where we think, oh, this is my favorite course. I'm going to give this great example that worked really well for me 30 years ago, 20 years ago, whatever. And the students look at you with sort of a blank face because it doesn't mean, it doesn't have the relevance that it does to you, to them. They don't, they don't care about the way that you do. By sort of seeing how do they care about it, are they caring about it in a way that is accurate or inaccurate, and that's to the point of are they using opinion versus expertise, um, that gives you a space to go in and say, I like how you're thinking about it, I like that you're thinking about it, but you get it a little bit wrong. This is actually works, this metaphor doesn't work very well, and you need to step in because otherwise they're going to go down this happy garden path. It's very entertaining for them, but not fruitful. It doesn't produce their uh, impact, their understanding very much. What we can do with that is absolutely use the best examples as seeds for the next semester. Um, because we are old, and our students oftentimes are much younger, and understand things in different ways. And this Hearing how they understand things helps us stay fresh and relevant, or at least helps us become better teachers, I hope. What do you do with the insufficient content? It, do you need it? What do you mean Say insufficient? In your, in your Pinterest board, you have the, the Victorian lace country, right? You right. Come up with somebody who's wearing you know, 2020 Nike shoes or something. I mean, it's going back to example, but. Do you delete that off the board? Or do you have a discussion about with that student about why this is insufficient? Or have that student sort of say in the presentation, yeah. this is my perspective, but it seems to have not hit the mark? So yesterday in the peer review session, Carolyn was here from uh, School of Human Ecology. She talked about doing um, feedback on student to student, student um, peer feedback um, for design stuff. If we, great example. Hey, you've got this, all this Victorian lace and these pair of 2020 Nike shoes. Class, can we give input on that? Can we give feedback on that? It's not just me as an instructor giving that feedback. It's other people giving that feedback as well. Yeah, will the student take off that 2020 pair of Nike shoes? Probably. As an instructor, and I'm wondering if this is the point that you're making, um, Example. The example. If I can take an example of really good examples of my student, of what my students did last semester, with their permission, of course, um, I would choose the good examples, probably, right? Um, I might choose less good examples, um, scrubbing their names and such off of it, but say, here's, here's a good example, here's another, here's another example. Which one's good? Which one's not good? One of these things is not, you know, is not like the other. Uh, how can we start to uh, analyze and 
and decide to evaluate on it. It seems like this is a lot of late goal. It's not a controlled, it's not as controlled as coming up, creating a PowerPoint and going through that step by step and not getting feedback. Anytime that you introduce somebody else's thoughts into your um, discussion, you are letting go of some control. You're not just letting it go, you're giving it to them. You are saying, I value you enough that I'm going to give you the chance to give us input on that. How does it how does it make you feel when somebody invites you into a conversation? You feel, oh, I'm valued, right. Relentless curiosity. What do you think? Intellectual competence. I think this. It's, this is why this is my favorite topic. Do most of the assignments get updated like Real time, because I guess what I'm wondering is like, if I'm not really sure what to, if I'm a student not sure what to put up in my example, instead of like thinking it through for myself, I just look at like what someone else did and kind of look something up based it's off close. Of that. Yeah. Um, so I guess I'm wondering what you guys do if you have suggestions about like, if things are, if you have them submit the assignment and then reveal it to everyone to see other people's content, or if they see it as it's coming in. I've always done it, um, share it as soon as you can, because as a student, I've often been lost, where it's like, I don't understand what I'm being asked to do, or I don't understand what they're looking for. If I see your example, then I'll be like, oh, okay, I get that, I understand that. Or if I, if I see your example and I think I understand that, that's good, but then Lauren does hers and hers is way different, then I'm like, Okay, wait a second. These are two different examples. I maybe I should ask an instructor rather than all right. We're all blind. Let's all submit our things. We've got thirty different things. Nobody understood what it was. What do you do at that point? I think there's some figuring out. What is it that I'm looking for? And that's good feedback for an instructor as well, right? My instructions were not very clear. Let's intervene and say, okay, dear students. Apparently, I did not give very good instructions. Here's an example that I came up with, and here's another example that I came up with. Based on these two examples, go find two more, 12 more, 14 more examples of that. Um, I think if you just give one example, and this is whether it's a model paper or anything, if you give one, as an instructor, if you give one example to the students, they will emulate that example. If you say, here's a good example of a paper, they're going to say, okay, paragraph one, switch out these words from my own words, but basically it's the same thing. Paragraph two, it's going to, you're going to end up as an instructor reading 30 copies of the same boring, good paper. But what will they have learned? Maybe they'll learn a law brief, right? Yes. There is a definite formula for doing a law brief. Give them an example of a traditional law brief, not some... You don't want a lot of creativity for those types of things, right? So what are your learning objectives? Do you want them to think wildly and creatively, or do you want them to think within a certain structure? And, and to do that in Canvas, can you use the discussion? Yeah, let's talk about Canvas discussions. And then well, I also want to talk about the assessment piece um, and having students involved in the assessment. I, said earlier that I think Canvas discussions are terrible because they're artificial and um, there's all kinds of discussions about discussions of, uh, about Canvas discussions on the Canvas community. And if you talk to students, you mention the word Canvas discussions and they'll be like, ugh, I absolutely hate that. Um, I don't have the answer on what a good Canvas discussion looks like. I do think that they should be called discussions because when I hear the word discussion, I think about face-to-face -face talking, seeing the nonverbals. Um, I'm not able to share resources on the fly generally in discussions. In asynchronous Canvas discussions, I can think about what I'm going to say, look at it, share it with a friend, and then hit submit. I can add in two or three resources that, that make my point for me and then hit submit. I don't have the time to do that in a face-to-face -face discussion because by the time I've done that, 
we're on eight different topics. We've, we've moved on from that. So the constraints are different. The affordances are totally different. It's not a discussion. It's an online forum, but the same tricks in a face-to-face -face discussion do not work in an online discussion. Peter? You know, there's two concrete things. I think that, you know, if it would be implemented, it would make Kansas discussion boards a lot more useful. One is to have a, um, the ability to have a subject head for your Yes. Yeah. And reply. Right. The other one is to have a thread, you know, to actually be able to respond to somebody and actually see where the conversation is going. Yeah. No. I think that is an option. You can have a checkbox for that. Those are not that hard to implement. Right. You know, but I don't know why they don't really do that. Well, and to your point earlier about having the students provide more context about why they do or don't understand something, Piazza is a really good way for students to do that anonymously to each other and um, identify it to the instructor. I don't understand this because I don't get this other part. The other students can see that and be like, oh, I thought I was the only one without outing themselves as I'm the dummy who doesn't get it. Um, they can say, yes, plus one on that, plus one on that. And then somebody else can come in and be like, oh, I understand it this way. So now the students are sharing content with each other and they're saying, I hear your problem. I, I, this is how I figured it out. And somebody else can say, yeah, I also figured it out kind of like that, but with this twist. And now they're solving problems for each other. That's a great example of student curated content and help students helping each other, students building up a community of learners. It's a, a, a really lovely example, I think. Let's talk about getting students involved in their assessment. Agency, um, one of the big things that I will say is learning, good learning is giving, I'm going to get this wrong, but that's okay. I'm going to paraphrase. Giving students the agency and power, empowering students as it was, empowering students to explore good problems that reveal systems. Empowering students, let's get them involved in their learning to explore good problems. Not to solve necessarily good problems, because some problems, the best problems, are not the ones that are easily solved, right? But to good problems might not be good for me, but it's good for them. It's good for the whoever's exploring it. So that gets them interested in it. In order to reveal systems, and that's the part that, that's where like the really deep stuff happens, right? They're not just memorizing to answer problem, answer questions, but they're saying, oh, now that I understand what failure in the system looks like and what success in the system looks like, I now can say this other thing will happen here and this will happen. And if I take this thing over here, it'll be more over here on the failure side. So they start to understand the systems and that's deeper understanding. From the get go, they have to be involved in the what are good problems and it has to be relevant to them as a class. So. Get them involved in the rubric making. First time they do it, they're not going to know what a good rubric is or what a five versus a one is in a rubric, right? They'll have some ideas, but if you can get them start, start them thinking about that, the first rubric, throw it away. They'll use it and they'll learn, but it'll be mostly guided by you. The second rubric, they'll have a little bit better understanding about that so they can have a better rubric but you're asking them to help make those rubrics, you're getting them involved in Bloom's evaluation you know, or synthesis or whatever the rubric. Does it show understanding? Does it show creation? Does it show synthesis? Um, whatever. Matthew. Yeah, so I've been doing this with some of my, my lab essays, and um, I just get a sense of, like, they believe that it's for higher educational purposes and they're not necessarily interested in higher ed or education at all, and so they're just doing it because I'm asking them to do it without any care about it. I have students also helping with the Canvas course page and things like that that seem more interested in developing it, but overall, it's just kind of hard, I guess, to justify students making rubrics or doing things that generally educators do. So they see it as, this is your job, teacher, not my yeah, job. Why are you doing, why am I doing this? Right. Yeah. So how do you overcome that situation? Agency without like explicitly telling them 
you know, I'm allowing you or giving you an opportunity to help teach this class and they're not interested in that. Yeah. Um, a similar thing happened. Um, I was in game design for a long time. We would make mobile apps and we'd come in and we'd talk to students about what kind of a mobile app they would want to make. And they would say things like, oh, make it like Doom, but with Madison, right? So 3D buildings, da 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 da. They're saying, describing this multi million dollar high end game. And we're like, yeah, can't do that. We've got, you know, a thousand dollar budget and two afternoons. But as soon as we were able to say, okay, let's have you make a game, you know, using pennies and sticks or whatever pieces of paper, whiteboards, whatever, you know, make your own board game, they would make a terrible game. But it was fun for them. They got to determine what's important, what's not important. They would start to have a little bit more um, empathy and humility about what to expect from me as an instructor. So they would see their fun but really kind of terrible game. They'd be like, this is awesome. And then they'd see my game, which was better because I had $1,000 and more time to work on it. And they'd say, this is, that's actually a lot better versus start off with the video, you know, compare it with a video game that they've played and paid, you know, $80 for. So essentially I'm selling it wrong. Well, I think you need to say, you need to, the expectations, right? So what is important to student to you in this job? As you foresee a, your path forward, someday you will be needing to evaluate things. Right? What will your evaluations look like in that in the field? And use that. Use that as a basis. Not as a, what will it, you will need to evaluate as a teacher in the field, but in the field. Make it authentic for them. What will your manager be to be evaluating you on? Right. What will your supervisor be evaluating on you on? And so it's not teacher. It's different. Armel, you were going to say something, or no? Okay. I think students, maybe their developmental level of where they are, they might not be able to see it. Absolutely. But you won't be there 20 years later, and then you're like, ta da, moment. The light bulb goes on. <laughs> It's a developmental model. They are developing. How can we help them develop? It's and we're not, you know, the first time it's not gonna be perfect. We're not gonna be like, do it once and they're done, all grown up. Look at them go. Um, it's gonna be they do it and then they make these mistakes and they stay up too late and they, you know, go out and get in trouble with the law. And, you know, all of these things are gonna sort of happen along their development. Um, there will be failures, but you know, that's like how do we stay encouraged? You know, when that kind of feedback isn't really available at that this moment in time. <laughs> well, I think like intrinsic, I guess. As instructors, we have to celebrate our own failures yeah. and say, huh, totally figured out how to not do this student curation thing, but that doesn't mean that it's a terrible thing. It just means that the way that, you know, asking them to submit their favorite Chaucerian piece in Middle English, was it somehow that didn't connect with them? I don't understand. Um, but maybe try again. Maybe thinking of ourselves decades ago, and like there was one example where, where a stats prof, she would always go over how to do the problem the day after we did the homework. Mm -hmm. And it was always like, oh my gosh, I struggled with this for hours before figuring out how to do it, and then, you know, years later realize, like, oh, the struggle, the struggle helps is... you learn it. And so I guess in the moment when you feel like, I'm doing this thing and they're not getting it, you can think back to maybe, I know for myself at least, I really didn't get it, but now I can, I think I get it a little more. <laughs> well, and I think that there's, 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 there's a lot of value in helping them recognize one, that this is good for them, right? And we all know that as an adult, if you talk to a kid and you say, this is good for you, they're going to be like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> but if they hear it from the person who's a year older than them or a person who just went through the class last year and they say, yeah, I struggled with the second, second week of class when my 
that instructor had us do this whatever thing freaked me out. I hated it, but in the end, it helped me. Da -da 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 -da. Student curated content. Can you get past students from your courses to come in or via, make little TikTok video and say, I was in Arla's class. Week two, she has us do this terrible assignment. It actually turned out a good assignment because it set the stage for da 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 da. -da. If you say that, they're not going to listen. They're not going to care. If somebody that is their age, that looks, sounds, acts like them, um, that they recognize and feel familiar with, says it, they'll be like, okay, I can learn from peers because they learn from peers all the time. How do you study? How do you, what apps work? What apps don't work? How can I get through this class that I'm currently sinking in? Um, and if somebody who has gone through that succeeded, they'll be like, tell me all of your secrets. They won't ask you to tell you their, your secrets because you don't, you don't understand my life. <laughs> so. Have we not talked, I feel like we've talked about all of these. Any other? There are examples in our activity sheets. Um, one of the favorite things is, one of my favorite things that I want to add to the activity sheet is uh, this one, and it's Pinterest group. And I don't know if they're, I think he showed, I think we have a video of him showing some of the different um, Pinterest boards. But it was kind of a neat, I had never considered Pinterest as a teaching tool, but having the students sort of put together their own collections, one, it's something that they can then show and use as a basis for further work, but and share with each other. Um, but it was also the one that helped him understand, oh, this is relevant to the students in this way. And so he was able to also change his course up. Lauren, last word. Since we started with discussion boards and yeah. how awful they can be. Um, Promising. Especially Yet. for Growth larger mindset. courses, you know, like the 100 people plus courses. My daughter's at a university in Utah. And for science courses, they're using something called Pathback. I haven't used it, so I don't really know all about what it works, how it works. But the idea is that the students, a certain number of times a week, are supposed to ask, point, ask questions that are good questions. And something about this Pathback system coaches them on how to ask a more open-ended question and one that digs a forces students to dig a little bit deeper. I don't know how it does it because I can't personally get it to her account to see what it looks like. <laughs> um, but it might be something to explore in terms of getting deeper content from students. And it's Pathback. We just pulled it up. Pathback.co, I think, is their, yeah. which means they're from Columbia. I don't think it matters at any point anymore. <laughs> you can get that, um, whatever you'd like to know. It seems, I'm curious about it and how it improves discussion. They have Canvas, so they would have had the choice, but they're actually paying for this. And in the little bit that I've read about it, it cuts down the professor time because somehow it curates the content and pushes forward to the professor the most the, the best sort of like the Google moderator where like people, that. yeah, things filter to the top. Yeah, and I don't know how it does it, or, but if anybody wants to explore that, I would love to learn more about how that thing works. Okay, there's also Harmonize is another Canvas plugin that um, makes discussions easier and better. Um, a lot of these tools I will add as a disclaimer, not supported by Madison. We are hoping that Canvas develops their work, awesome. their vanilla um, offerings. Um, yeah. The, the catch with that, of course, with Canvas is that they have so many moving parts that a, a system like this that's really focused on doing one thing does it really, really well. Right. Where it's easy to pause for Canvas to do this really, really well. And all, all the other things. things. Yeah. But, yeah. All right. Thank you all for coming. Um, if you would, on your way out, check a couple of the boxes, leave your muddiest points. And <laughs> etc. <cetera, laughs> on on the bottom of this, if you have any thoughts on 
uh, ways that I should present the activity, active teaching lab to um, a national audience of professional development folks. Um, write those ideas down here and help me be presented next week. I will not be here next week. JT will be taking over both of the labs. So come help him um, do that. I'm not even going to be able to support him. And so he needs, he needs your help. Well, he doesn't need your help. He's great. You've seen him. Okay. Thank you.